Today I stand before you as Elijah Daniel DeWitt's mom. Being Elijah and Delaney's mom is the greatest title I have ever achieved in my life. Elijah was born on August 31st, 2004 at 829 AM to two parents beyond excited, so in love with his precious soul immediately. And we understood that this time, tiny human had our heart. 28 months later, we had Delaney. At first, I was scared that I could not love anyone the way I loved him. Yet, God has a way to grow a mom's heart. Elijah was just as in love with her as we introduced Elijah to Delaney. At first, he thought she was a baby doll until she moved around. His eyes got big, and at that moment, he became a big brother. His deep, sweet voice, he then called her Haney Grace. I say that all to say on 10-5, I, I, as his mom, was sentenced to walking the rest of my life with half a heart. And to live with half a heart is almost impossible. That is how every day now feels for me. And I do want to say my husband can't speak because he ended up getting sick and he is sitting in the car. But he does feel this exact same way. <clears throat> Part of understanding the amazing responsibility of parenting was never more true than the night of Elijah's murder. I stood before a police officer and begged him to let me go be with Elijah. Elijah was laying on the ground in the parking lot all alone as I stood there and watched him just lay there. Being dead was not making sense to me. He was 40 feet away. I could see his clothes and his shoes that he walked out of my front door in a few hours before. I wasn't scared to be with him. That is all I wanted. But Elijah did not just die. He was murdered, and well, I could not touch him. Even if I could go be with him, I could not touch him. I have been with Elijah through every step of his life, through puke, poop and puke and injuries. And that day, he was, mur he was a murder victim. And the child I love with all of my soul, he is dead. And I stood there with blue light shining in my eyes watching my kid dead, shot in the heart dead. So bad that I could not hold his hand and he was alone. Living with Elijah every day, talking to him, laughing with him, seeing his smile, hearing his voice. His life stopped, and his heart could not beat the bullet. With all that, the dream stopped. He did not get to graduate high school and ride off to college with a packed car of dorm room plans. He did not get married and leave with his wife on a horse and carriage or a limousine or even a taxi. Elijah's ride was the Gwinnett County Crab Lab van. They picked up that beautiful baby, that beautiful boy, our son, Delaney's brother, and placed him into a crime lab van. As they drove him away, the fire department began to clean the scene and wash the ground. Elijah's blood was washed into a sewer. I do not think there are words that describe this. Elijah left home to go have fun on fall break, and now he is dead. Not just dead, he is murdered, he is alone. He is at a Gwinnett County crime lab. And that just honestly was not even a place we knew existed. Each day I wake up, I still gasp for air as I'm reminded again, he is not here. He is a murder victim and he is not coming home. I get up and I look at his arm, that's why I brought it, to be sure I'm not crazy. Each day I then relive and remember again, he is gone and he is not coming home. Then I do my best to live that day. As I have understood, there is no medicine, no surgery, no therapy, nothing that brings him back. The pain it is impossible to describe. And nothing helps me. Anger doesn't help me. I just have all this pain of loss and nowhere to put it. Let me, I just want to explain a little bit about Elijah. When Elijah turned 18, we were in my kitchen and we talked, um, I'm like, well, now you can vote and you can be an organ donor. And he was pretty interested because Herschel Walker was um, running in the election and I don't have all the facts behind it, but we were just talking. And I'm like, well, now you get your chance to vote and be an organ donor. An unfortunate part of life is Elijah's grandmother had died of pancreatic cancer and they were able to donate her corneas. and. Being as close as we all were, my children were aware of that. And as we sat in my kitchen, I'm like, 
well, those are the things you can do. And he's like, absolutely would want to do that. So not only did he continue to inspire and live even after he was dead, he was willing to give up parts of him for someone else. And um, one of the statements that I was that came to my mind is that um, that Elijah understood if you could help even after death, this is a good thing, and that is what he did. So I'd like to give him credit for that because that was not my decision. And God has a funny way of making conversations happen when you have no idea why. <clears throat> I don't think that people really realize like what and I don't even think we realized and, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing but to hear his friends and hear Bailey screaming over the phone and knowing I've got to get there it was my husband's birthday and I, I went to Kroger and now I'm in a like a hibachi place trying to get food and I get her call, and she's just like, Elijah's been shot. And I'm like, no way. What? And she's like, he's shot. And I'm like, where are you? She said, find me. And I'm like, where are you? And that's when she said, Dave and Buster's. That moment of his, of his actual shooting and death did not just create, you know, pain. It created extreme trauma. For a lot of people, especially his friends, the other people who stopped to help him, so traumatic that they can't let their, the mother even go up and see their own child. So I just want to bring forth that those kids and the people that are there need to be recognized here as well for the unimaginable trauma. And then his friends not only dealt with that, and Bailey, his girlfriend, they then dealt with major trauma and extreme loss. So I, I want to bring that out because what I what I want people to understand in, in these types of crimes and and this does not just stop that like it my life will never be the same. I can hardly drive. I don't even want to go down 85 and I grew up here. You know, because I relive the screams. I relive having to hear the police officer Tell Bailey because she's telling me get there. If you can get here, they'll help him. But they already knew he was gone, and I had to be told that over the phone. And then I have to, you know, I had to tell my daughter that her brother is dead over the phone. And that is not something that you can even explain of like the how that feels. And. So I'm going to get back to this, but I did want to make sure that I recognized those sweet children who saw an, just something that should have never, never happened. But to stand here today and explain or describe how we suffer, honestly, it's not humanly possible. I've sat for days trying to put it into words, but they just do not exist. I could say what we will miss out on, such as graduation football games where he would battle it out and come home off the field sweaty and stinky, yet he was so proud. I could talk about the talks and support and love of a brother to my daughter. I could, But what I see is the emptiness in Delaney's eyes every day, missing him. I could even say, oh, the wedding we're going to miss out, or the wife he will never have, the beautiful grandchildren we will never have. But most, most of all of it is, is we miss our son, not just what he could have been. We miss him. I miss watching him sleep. I miss hearing his voice. I miss just every part of his being. I do want to show what I have physically left of him, Elijah was 6 to 190 pounds, blonde headed. And this is what I have physically. And this is what I have. And that should not be. 
I will say this tragedy, the darkness in this even makes the light sad. I will tell you there is a longing and desperation inside of my soul that is impossible to fill or ever to refill because Elijah will never come home, breathe air, eat a hamburger, laugh, see the sunrise or sunset, feel the salt of the ocean, and again, there's just no words that express that pain. I wish I could trade my soul for you so we could live. But today, I will leave this courtroom with his ashes, his hair, and we as a family will leave us three, not four, and I'll go home without him with one true hope. And this is my hope for any words that I've shared today, that no one ever goes through the pain we have been sentenced to for the rest of the days that we live. And thank you so much for the, everything the court has done for our family and just being so respectful through such a crazy time. Thank you for sharing these things with us. I'm sorry for your thoughts. Thank you. 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 Your Honor, next, the state would call Beverly Summers up.